Alrighty, there we go. <laughs> Didn't demute my mic. Real clever. Um, alrighty, welcome back to Free Read Fridays. I'm your intrepid narrator, Fraga, and uh, today we're reading the next chunk of Acceptance by Jeff Vandermeer. Vandermeer? Hmm. Gotta find out where the capitals are. I think it's V-A-N-D-E-R and capital M-E-E-R, but I am not 100% sure. Yes, that is how it's written. I've been writing it wrong the entire time. I'm not going to go back and re-edit it. Sorry. Sorry, Jeff. My bad. All right, so previously on... Um, well, we met Grace. Grace is still kicking. Uh, Grace made it to, um, Failure Island, which is where Control and Ghostbird have headed. Ghostbird, who is the, uh, doppelganger of the biologist from Authority. One of the 11th Expeditions. And uh, or 12th expeditions. One of the 12th expeditions. 11th expedition is her husband, which is one of the reasons she goes. Uh, also, the us, the biologist is back. That's nice. Um, she's not what you would call human anymore. <laughs> not really. Uh, I love how she's described as well. It's it's pretty brilliant. Um, I kind of like the implication here as well, uh, and I'll try and remember to talk about that uh, when we get to the end of this uh, of, of this week's reading uh, because I think it's one of the biggest insights we actually have on what exactly area X is up to and what area X does to you um, I, th I think she's she's fairly indicative what has happened to her anyway okay oh yeah before i start uh what we've got here is some artwork uh that somebody did and posted online someone named topra man t-o-p-r-a-h-m-a-n um that they posted and they said and i quote i just finished the trilogy last friday and went to a friend's painting party i've never i've never made a painting before but felt inspired by the book and this is their interpretation of what the biologist looked like after she transformed um, and i like it as an abstract indication or representation of the biologist um, as a lot of eyes <laughs> You know, kind of, kind of going to be relevant for what we're about to go through here, um, as we switch to Control's perspective. I don't think Control is going to take this very well. Do you? Poor Control. He's just not in his element. Oh, I hope I did not just press that button. I just pressed that button. Did that break anything? Not yet. Maybe. Okay. Whatever, let's get cracking. Thanks to everybody tuning in when you tune in. Zero, zero, 0013 control half the wall exploded and a thousand eyes peered in as control sprawled from the impact in the dust and debris his head throbbed and there was a pain in his side and his left leg but he forced himself to lie still he was playing dead just to keep his head he was playing dead to keep his head 
a line from a book about monsters his father had read to him as a child, rising out of a place long forgotten like a flare shot into the sky. Knocked into his brain, it kept looping, playing dead to keep his head. The brick dust settling now, those eyes still and awful, an awful pressure. Even as the crunch of glass, the obliterating sound of that, the questing horror of that, sounded near his ear, and then the weight shifting near his legs, he fought the impulse to open his eyes, because he had to play dead to keep his head. Somewhere to his right, the knife he'd dropped, and his father's carving falling out of his pocket. Even sprawled as he was sprawled, seeking it with a trembling hand, reflexively. He was shivering, he was shaking, the reverberations of the creature's passage creating a pain like cracks and fissures in his bones, the brightness trying to escape, the part of him that was lonely, that wanted to reach out. Playing dead. To keep his head. The glass crunch, the crunch glass, and its source beyond the wall, exploring inward, held his full attention. Boot? Shoe? Foot? No. Claws? Hooves? Cilia? Fins? Suppressed a shudder. Could he reach his knife? No. If he could have reached his knife in time, if his knife had been any help, it wouldn't have happened like this, except, yes, it was always going to be like this. Border breach, but there was no border here. It had all been moving so slow, like a journey that was no that meant something, and now so fast, too fast, like breath that had become light, gone from mist to a ray, slashing out toward the horizon, but not taking him with it. On the other side of the half-demolished wall, a new thing, an old thing, but not a mistake. Was there anything in it now of what he'd once known through its surrogate? Because he recognized its eyes. Some part of it enveloped him, held him there, against the floor, while he screamed. Something like an eclipse in his head, a thick, tactile eclipse, pushing out his own intent. Questing through his mind for something else entirely, making him turn inward to see the things Lowry had put there, the terrible, irre irrevocable things, and how his mother must have helped Lowry. Check the seats for loose change, Grandpa Jack had said. Or had he? The heavy shape of the gun in his hands, Grandpa Jack's greedy gaze, and yet even that childhood memory seemed as hazy as smoke curling up from the cigarette of someone who stood in shadow at the far end of a long, darkened room. Those thousands of eyes regarding him, reading him from across a vast expanse of space, as if the biologist existed simultaneously halfway across the universe. The sensation of being seen, and then relief, and a stabbing disappointment as it withdrew, spit him out, rejected him. There came a sound like a weight leaving the sky, a plunging toward the waves, and the awful weight of a pushing against the air lessened, and the restless agony in his bones receded, and he was just a dirty, spent figure weeping on the floor of a ruined lighthouse. With words like collateral damage and containment and counterattacks blossoming like old spells, incantations that worked in other far distant lands, but not here. He was back in control, but control was meaningless. His father's sculptures in his old backyard were, tip were tipping over, one after the other. The chess moves between them in those last days before his father had died. The pressure of the piece between his fingers as he moved it, and the empty air as he let go. Silence, then. An absence into which the brightness again took up sentinel duty, swung around with ever greater confidence to peer at him like the leviathans from his dreams. Perhaps unaware of what it protected, what it lived within. Except he would never forget now.
later, much later, familiar steps and a familiar voice, Grace extending a hand. Can you walk? Could he walk? He felt like an old man leveled by a blow from an invisible fist. He had fallen into a deep, dark, narrow fissure and now had to crawl up out of it. <coughs> yes, I can walk. Grace handing him his father's carving, him taking it. Let's go back up to the landing. But there was a huge hole in the side of the first floor wall. The knight peered in from it. But the lighthouse had held. Yes, the landing. He would be safe there. He wouldn't be safe there. Control lay there, back on the landing, sprawled across a blanket, looking up at the paint-peeled ceiling mottled by candlelight. Everything seemed so far away. Such an overwhelming psychic sense of their distance from Earth that there might not now be a, a str that th such an overwhelming psychic sense of their distance from Earth that there might not now be astronomers, might never be astronomers who, all knowing, could even make out the speck that was the star around which they must revolve. He found it hard to breathe, kept calling forth another passage from the pages of Whitby where the man almost waxed poetic. Area X has been created by an organism left behind by a civilization so advanced and so ancient and so alien to us and our own intent and our own thought processes that it has long since left us behind, left everything behind. Wondering, too, because of all that the biologist's intrusion had knocked loose in his head, if there was any evidence he'd ever sat in the back seat of his grandfather's muscle car, if somewhere at Central you, you would find black and white photos shot from farther down the street through the windshield of a car or van, an investment, a divestment, the start of it all. He'd had dreams of cliffs and leviathans and falling into the sea, but what if the leviathans were back at Central? The shadowy forms, mere outlines of memories he could not quite recall, overlaid with those he should not remember because they had never occurred. Jump, a voice had said, and he had jumped. Two days lost at Central before he came to the Southern Reach, and only his mother's word for it that he was being paranoid. But it was such a weight, so exhausting to analyze, as if the Southern Reach and Area X both interrogated him. Hello, John, said some version of Lowry in his head. Surprise! Fuck you. Seriously, John? And here I thought you knew all along the game we were playing. The game we've always been playing. His lungs felt heavy. Thick, as Grace checked him out, bandaged his elbow, told him, You've bruised some ribs, and your hip is bruised too, but you seem able to be you seem able to move everything. The biologist she's really gone? This Leviathan that has taken the terroir of a place and made it its own. Every moment that passed, the gospel of Whitby made more and less sense to him. Such an inconsistent heartbeat, such simplicity to concentrate on those three pages, to focus on the parts so smudged he had to interpret the words or to smooth out a curled corner, than on the fact that the sun should not be si should not be shining above, that the sky could peel back to reveal a celestial landscape perhaps never dreamed of by humankind, the weight of that oppressive. The weight of that oppressive, a beast bearing down on the very center, which must be protected from that which did not bear contemplating. She's been gone for a while, Grace said. You've been a little gone for a while. She stood next to the seaward window, along with Ghostbird. Ghostbird had her back to control. 
Ghostbird had her back to control, staring out at the night. Was she charting her original's progress? Was that vast form now in open water, seeking depth and distance? Or had she departed for some place stranger and more remote? He didn't want to know. When Ghostbird finally turned, the shadows made of her face an impression of a fading smile and wide, curious eyes. What did it share with you? Control asked. What did it take? More caustic than he'd meant, but he was still but he was still in a kind of shock, knew that on some level. Wanted his experience to be the common one. Nothing. Nothing at all. What side are you on? Lowry asked. What side are you on? he asked. Enough. Grace said. Enough! Just shut the fuck up! That's not helping! But he couldn't shut up. No wonder you're on edge, he said. No wonder you didn't tell us. The biologist took out the convoy, Ghostbird said. Yes, she did, Grace admitted. But I've been... But I have been careful and quiet and not provoked her. I know when to stay away from the lighthouse or the shore. I know when to fade into the forest. Sometimes there's a kind of foreshadowing in the air. Sometimes she will make landfall where she found the owl, then push on through the interior, headed here. As if she remembers. Most times I can avoid her. Most times she isn't here. Remembers what? This place? I don't know what she remembers or doesn't remember, Grace said. I just know your presence here attracted her, made her curious. Not Control's presence, that much he knew. Ghostbird's presence. The biologist was drawn to her as surely as he had been drawn to her. We could be just like the biologist. Control said, stay here, wait it out, wait her out, just give in, goading them. But it was Ghostbird who answered. She earned the right to choose her fate. She earned the right. We're not her, Grace said. I don't want to become her or anything like her. Isn't that all you've been doing? Waiting? wanting to see just how well Grace had adjusted to living on an island with a monster. Not exactly, but what do you want me to do? Tell me what I should do, and I will do it! Shouting now. Do you think I want to wait here, die here? Do you think I like it? The thought occurred that Grace had made use of the biologist's list of pain inducers, that her thinness, that hollowed-out quality to her face, wasn't just about being haunted by a monster. You need a way out, Ghostbird said. Through a hole in the sea that may not be there? No, another way out. Control propped himself up with a groan. His side was on fire. Are you sure the ribs are just bruised? I can't be sure without an x-ray. Another impossible thing. Yet another moment in his decline. A wall changing to the touch of his hand, the touch of the biologist in his head. Enough of this. Enough. He took up Whitby's pages, read by candlelight even as he began to tear the corners off. Slowly. We must trust our thoughts while we sleep. We must trust our hunches. We must begin to examine all of those things that we think of as irrational simply because we do not understand them. In other words, we must distrust the rational, the logical, the sane, in an attempt to reach for something higher, for something more worthy. Brilliance and bullshit, both. A binary trapped in its single-minded focus on solutions. What? he asked. He could feel the other two staring at him. Ghostbird said, You need to rest. What I'd suggest isn't going to be popular anyway, he said, tearing one full page into shreds, letting the pieces fall to the floor. 
It felt good to tear something apart. Say it, challenging him. A pause, preparing himself, aware of the conflicting voices in his head. What you call the crawler, we have to try. We have to go back down into the tower and find some way to neutralize it. Ghostbird, have you been paying attention? Have you been listening? Or we stay here. Staying here isn't going to work, Grace admitted. Either the biologist will get us, or Area X will. There's a lot of open, vulnerable space for us between here and the, t and the tower, Ghostbird said. There's a lot of everything between here and there. Control, Ghostbird said, and he didn't want to look at her, didn't want to see those eyes that now reminded him of the creature the biologist had become. Control, there's no reset. There's never going to be a reset. That's a suicide mission. Unspoken that she thought it was a suicide mission for them. Who knew what it might be for her? But the director thought you could change its direction, he said. That you could change it if you tried hard enough. A halting kind of hope. A childish thrashing against the dictates of the real. If you wished upon a star... He was thinking of the light at the bottom of the tower, this new thing he hadn't known about before entering Area X. He was thinking about being sick, and now sicker, and what that meant. At least they were all out in the open now, clear to him. The brightness, Lowry, all of it. Everything in the mix, including the core he still thought of as John Rodriguez. The Rodriguez who didn't belong to anyone who clasped his father's carving tight in his pocket, who remembered something beyond the wreck and ruin of all this. "'It's true we have one thing no one else had,' Grace said. "'What?' Ghostbird, uh, Ghostbird asked in a skeptical, doubting tone. "'You,' Grace said, "'the only photocopy of the director's last plan.' Zero, zero, 0014 the director when eventually you return to the southern reach you find a gift waiting for you a framed black and white photograph of the lighthouse keeper his assistant and a little girl playing on the rocks head down jacket hood disguising her features the blood rushes to your head and you almost black out seeing that this photo you didn't know still existed it's for your office, reads the pointed note that comes with it. You should hang it on the wall there. In fact, you must keep it on the wall, as a reminder of how far you've come, for your years of service and for your loyalty. Love and kisses, Jimmy Boy. That's when you realize there is something very much more wrong with Lowry than you'd ever thought before that he creates ever more spectacular and grandiose dysfunctions to test what the system might bear before it finds him out. He seems, year after year, to revel in his clandestine operations not because they are secret, but for those tantalizing moments when, either by his own hand or by fate, the edges of them almost become known. Put everything we have on Jackie Severance you tell Grace, pull every file that mentions Jack Severance, and the son, and the son, John Rodriguez. Even if it takes a year, we're, going for, we're looking for something that connects Severance, any Severance, to Lowry. You've got a sense of an unholy alliance, a devilish foundation, an inkling of bad faith, something hidden in the grout between the stones. Meanwhile, you have a plant and a cell phone, very early model, to deal with. All you have to show for your journey. Other than a new sense of being separate, remote, set apart from the staff. 
When you see Whitby in the hallway now, sometimes you meet his gaze and nod, and there is a sense of a secret shared. Other times you must look away, stare at that worn green carpet that meanders through everything, make some polite comment in the cafeteria to try to immerse yourself in meetings as they prep another expedition. Try to pretend everything is normal. Is Whitby broken? His smile flickers back into place at times. His old confident stance, the wit in Whitby, will, re will reappear, but not for long, and then a light winks out in his eyes and darkness comes back in. There's nothing you could say to Whitby except, I'm sorry, but you can't even say that. You can't change the moments that changed him except in your memory, and even in memory that attempt is obscured by the fast-rising thing from below, the thing that terrified you so much you abandoned Saul there on the tunnel steps. Said to yourself afterward that Saul wasn't real, couldn't be real, so you hadn't abandoned anyone. Don't forget about me he'd said so long ago, and you won't ever forget him, but you might have to leave him behind. That apparition. The hallucination that, as you sit at the bar in Chipper's star lanes or debate policy with Grace on the Southern Reach rooftop, you still try to rationalize as not a hallucination at all. In part because you came back with the plant. For a time, you are obsessed with each dark green leaf, the way looking at it from above, looking at it from above, it forms a kind of fan-like circle, but from the side, the effect fades completely. If you focus on the plant, maybe you can forget Lowry, waiting out there for a while. Maybe Saul won't matter. Maybe you can salvage something out of nothing. The plant will not die. No parasites will touch the plant. The plant will not die. No extremes of temperature will affect it. Freeze it, it will thaw. Burn it, it will regenerate. The plant will not die. No matter what you try, no matter the experiments performed on it in the sterile, the blinding white environs of the storage cathedral. Let's try that sentence again in a way that isn't mangled horribly. Angar. No matter what you try, no matter the experiments performed on it in the sterile, the blinding white environs of the storage cathedral, the plant won't die. It's not that you mean to order its execution, but that in the course of the samples taken, the researchers inform you that the plant refuses to die. That cutting... You could chop it up into five dozen tiny pieces, put those in a measuring cup, sprinkle it on a steak for seasoning, and in theory, it would grow inside of you, eventually burst forth, seeking sunlight. So, relenting, you let samples be whisked away to Central, so that experts can solve the mystery of this simple, ordinary plant that looks like any number of temperate climate perennials. Samples, too, to Lowry's secret headquarters, perhaps to reside next to cages in experimental bunkers, although none of their findings ever come back to you. All of this in the midst of a frenzied slicing and dicing of other specimens in the storage cathedral, just to make sure there hasn't been some domino effect or something's been missed. But nothing has been missed. I don't think we're looking at a plant, Whitby says, tentative, at one status meeting, risking his new relationship with the science division, which he has embraced as a kind of sanctuary. Then why are we seeing a plant, Whitby? Cheney, managing to convey an all-consuming exasperation. Why are we seeing a plant that looks like a plant being a plant? Doing plant things, like photosynthesis and drawing water up through its roots. Through its roots. Why? That's not a tough question, is it? Really? Or is it? Maybe it is a tough question. I don't know, for reasons beyond me. 
But that's going to be a problem, don't you think? Having to reassert that things we think are things that they actually are, or in fact the things they are, and not some other thing entirely. Just think of all the fucking things we will have to reevaluate if you're right, Whitby. Starting with you! Cheney's blistered, reddening expression bears down on Whitby as if he were the receptacle of every evil thing that has ever afflicted Cheney since the day he was born. Because, Cheney says, lowering his voice, if that's a tough question, don't we all have to reclassify, don't we have to reclassify all the really tough questions? Later, Whitby will regale you with information on how quantum mechanics impacts photosynthesis, which is all about antenna receiving light and antenna can be hacked, about how one organism might peer out from another organism but not live there, of how plants talk to one another, how communication can occur in chemical form and through processes so invisible to human beings that the sudden visibility of it would be an irreparable shock to the system. For the Southern Reach? For humanity? But Whitby's close-lipped about that changes the subject abruptly. Oh, hey, thanks for tuning in, B333. Glad you're digging it. I would not start a trilogy if I weren't going to finish it. Probably. I hope. I think. Unless the trilogy was really, really bad. I won't be reading Bio of a Space Tyrant on stream. Unless, like, a bunch of people are like, you need to read Bio of a Space Tyrant on stream. Because that is not very good. (laughs) For a number of reasons. Okay. You're less obsessed with the cell phone, which has been living with the techs down in the hardware department, the ones who have the right security clearance. But the techs can't make it work, are confused by it, perhaps even unnerved. Nothing about it indicates a malfunction. It should work. It just doesn't. It should reveal who owned it. It just doesn't. As if it's not really made of the parts it should be made of. But it looks exactly that way, like a normal phone. Really old, though. A bulky veteran of a phone, scarred and scraped and worn. It looks like you feel sometimes. You offer it to Lowry during one of your calls, as a kind of sacrifice of a pawn. Give Lowry an exclusive. Let him worry at it like a dog with a new bone, so the old bone can get some rest. But he doesn't want it insists you keep it. Something an expedition member had snuck in with them or inadvertently brought along? Something perhaps from a recent expedition that someone had thought was old enough not to disturb Area X's slumber? During the cycles that predated Lowry's intervention, your stewardship, techniques primitive and untested. Recalling the very earliest photographs and video, of Lowry and the others in what amounted to deep-sea diving outfits to traverse the the border before they realized it was unnecessary. Lowry returned, disoriented, babbling on videotape words he would later recant about how nothing would ever come out of the passage in the border, nothing because they were waiting for ghosts, for something long dead, Area X, a memorial, a gravestone. What made Area X spit it back up? You ask Grace, safe on the roof and beyond reach. What made Whitby the one to find it? A good question. Why did it allow itself to be found? That sounds like the right question, and some days you want to tell Grace everything. But most days you want to shield her from information that will make no difference to her job, her life. Somehow, dead Whitby and the Saul apparition fall on the same side as telling her that your name is not your name. That all the unimportant things about you are a lie. Eventually, into the middle of all this, comes the call you've been dreading. Lowry with a purpose. While you're staring at the incriminating photograph on the wall, you 
on the rocks, shouting either before or after the shot was taken, I'm a monster! I'm a monster! Another eleventh expedition is a go. Al already? Three months. We're almost there. You want to say, but don't say, it's time to stop tampering, not time to intensify the tampering. The fiddling. All the ways Lowry tries to control what cannot really be controlled. That's too soon, you say. Too soon by far. Nothing has changed except that you interfered and went over the border and brought back two objects you can't explain. Maybe it's time for you to stop being a fucking coward, Lowry says. Three months. Get ready, Cynthia. He bangs the phone down, and you imagine him banging it down into a housing that's a polished human skull. The, they implant into the brain of the psychologist, on what will turn out to be the last eleventh, what Lowry calls a pearl of surveillance and recall. Recall. Sorry. Some tiny subset of the silver egg that is central, passing first through Lowry's deforming grip. Through La passing first through Lowry's deforming grip. They make a man not himself, and you go along with it to keep your job, to stay close to what is important to you. Twelve months later, the last eleventh expedition comes back, acting almost like zombies, memories cloudier than the drunk veterans at the Star Lane's lounge. Eighteen months later, they're all dead of cancer, and Lowry's back on the phone talking about the next eleventh, and making refinements to our process, and you realize something has to change. Again. And short of putting a gun to Lowry's head and pulling the trigger, it's going to come down to influencing the composition of the expeditions, how they are deployed, and a host of lesser factors. None of, which may, none of which may make a difference, but you have to try, because you never want to see such lost, vacant faces ever again. Never again want to see people who have been stripped of something so vital that it can't be expressed through words. Morale at the Southern Reach becomes worse after the, after the last 11th expedition. Let's try that again. Morale at the Southern Reach becomes worse after the last 11th returns and then, so quickly, passes on to the next place, whatever that, wherever that might be. Numbness? A sense of having gone through so many crises that emotion must be hoarded, that it might not run out. That it might not run out. I think. From the transcripts, it was a beautiful day. The expedition was uneventful. We had no problems in completing the mission. What was the mission in their eyes? But they'd never answer that question. Grace spoke of them in reverential tones, almost as if they'd become saints. Down in the science division, Cheney became more muted and subdued for a long time, as if the color TV of his commentary had been replaced by a black-and-white model with a single channel of pixelated fuzz. Ephemeral, ethereal Pittman called from Central with oblique condolences and a kind of calculated indifference to his tone that suggested misdirection. But you were the one who had seen the curling worm of Lowry's corruption at work. That what he'd done, that... That what he'd done, the bargain you had made, and... The bargain you had made that had allowed him to be so invasive and controlling, hadn't been worth it. Even worse, Jackie Severance visits regularly afterward, as if maybe Central is concerned about something, takes to pacing around your office and gesticulating as she talks, rather than just sitting still. This emissary of Central you have to deal with in the flesh rather than just Lowry. She's my parole officer, you tell Grace. Then who is Lowry? Lowry's the parole officer's partner? Boss? Employee? because you don't know. A riddle wrapped in a puzzle. 
Grace says. Do you know what her father, Jack Severance, is up to? No, what? Everything. So much everything that Grace is still wading through all of it. When Severance comes calling, there's a sense she's checking up on her investment, her shared risk. Does it ever get to you? Severance asks you more than once, and you're fairly sure she's just making conversation. No, you lie, shoot back your own cliché. We all have our jobs to do. Back when she worked for the Southern Reach, you'd liked her. Sharp, charming, and she'd done a good job of fine-tuning logistics, of diving in and getting work done. But since she's chained to Lowry, you can't risk that her presence isn't his presence. Sharing a swig of brandy with Grace. A living bug can't exactly just pull her out of the ceiling tiles. And the glamour has begun to fade. At times, Severance looks to you like a tired, faded clerk at a makeup counter in, the, in a department store. Severance sits with you, observing the returnees through closed-circuit cameras for long minutes, coffee in hand, checking her phone every few minutes, often drawn off into some side conversation about some other project altogether, then coming back, to, then coming back into focus to ask questions. You're sure they're not contaminated with something? When do you send in the next expedition? What do you think of Lowry's metrics? If you had a bigger budget, what would you spend it on? Do you know what you are looking for? No, you don't know. She knows. She knows you don't know. You don't even know what you're looking at, these people who became ever more gaunt until they were living skeletons, and then not even that. The psychologist perhaps even blanker than the rest, like a kind of warning to you, as if it were a side effect of his profession, encountering Area X. But a closer look at his history reveals Lowry probably leaned on him the most, thought, maybe, that his profession made him stronger than the rest. The bindings, the reconditioning sessions, the psychological tricks. Surely a psychologist could absorb them, armed with foreknowledge. Except the man hadn't, and as far as they knew, this coiled sting inside his brain had made no difference at all to Area X. There must be things you there must be things you would do differently. Sorry. There must be things you would have done differently, Severance says. You make some noncommittal sound and pretend you're scribbling something on your notepad. A grocery list, maybe. A blank circle that's either a representation of the border or of central. A plant rising out of a cell phone. Or maybe you should just write, fuck you, and be done with it. Gnaw your way out of Lowry's trap. Ooh, thanks for tuning in, Toby Frost. Thank you. It's no effort at all. It's a my pleasure. At some point after the last of the last eleventh passes away, you get black paint from maintenance, along with thick black markers, and you open the useless door that gives you access to the blank wall, casualty of a clumsy corridor redesign. You write out the words collected from the topographical anomaly, the words that you know must have been written by the lighthouse keeper, this flash of intuition unveiled at a status meeting, allowing you to order a deeper investigation into Saul's background than ever before. You draw a map, too, of all the landmarks in Area X. There's the base camp, or, as you call it now, the Mirage. There's the lighthouse, which should be some form of safety, but too often isn't, the place that journals go to die. There's the topographical anomaly, the hole in the ground into which all initiative and focus descended, only to become hazy and diffuse. There, too, is the island, and, finally, the southern reach itself, looking either like the last defense against the enemy, or its farthest most outport, out post. <laughs> Sorry. Looking either... L and finally, the Southern Reach itself, looking either like the... like... <sighs> my god, I'm having trouble here today. 
It is effort now! Oh no! <laughs> there, too, is the island, and, finally, the southern reach itself, looking either like the last defense against the enemy, or its, or its farthest most outpost. That is unnaturally hard to say. <laughs> Lowry, drunk out of his mind at his going-away party, headed for Central only three years after you had been hired, had said, How goddamn boring! Fucking boring if they win! If we gotta live in that world. As if people would be living in that world at all, which wasn't, any, which wasn't what any of the evidence foretold, or kept foretelling, as if there were nothing worse than being bored, and the only point of all of, and the only point of the world people already lived in was to find ways to combat boredom, to make sure all the moments, as Whitby put it when he went on about parallel universes, might be accounted for in some way, so minds wouldn't fill up with emptiness that they bifurcated simply to have more capacity to be bored. And Grace, fearless, an opposing voice from years later at some other party where a member of the staff had voiced an equally cynical, depressing opinion, but as if answering Lowry. I'm still here because of my family, because of my family and because of the director, and because I don't want to give up on them or you. Even if Grace could never share with her family the struggles she faced at the Southern Reach, being your right-hand gal, as Lowry puts it, sarcastically. The profane voice of reason when yours is perceived as too esoteric, too distant. Halfway through drawing the map, you feel eyes on you, and there's Grace, arms folded, giving you the stink eye. She closes the office door behind her, just keeps staring at you. Is there something I can help you with? you ask, paint can in one hand and brush in the other. You can reassure me that everything is okay. For one of the first times, you sense doubt from her. Not disagreement, but doubt. And given how much things rely on faith at the late-era Southern Reach, this worries you. I'm fine, you say. I'm just fine. I just want a reminder. Of what? The, to the staff? That you're getting a little eccentric? A surge of anger at that, a faint echo of hurt, too. Lowry, for all of his faults, might not think it was strange. He'd understand. But also, if it were Lowry painting a map of, on the wall of his office, no one would be questioning him. They'd be asking if they could hold the brush, touch up this spot, that spot, get him more paint. Going for the cumulative effect, to put more pressure on the breaking point, you say to Grace, After I'm done here, I'm going to order the bodies of the last eleventh exhumed. Why? Aghast, something in her background averse to such desecrations. Because I think it is necessary, which is enough of a reason having what Grace will call your Lowry moment. And it's not even that volcanic, just stubbornness. Cynthia, Grace says, Cynthia, what I think or don't think doesn't matter, but the rest of the staff has to want to follow you. More stubborn thought still, that all you really need is Lowry to follow you in severance, and you could hold on here forever. Hideous thought, though. The image of another's 36 expeditions being sent out, only some coming back, of you and Grace and Whitby, progressively more jaded and cynical, becoming ancient, going through the motions that wouldn't help anyone, not even yourselves. I'm going to finish this up, you tell her in a conciliatory way, because I started it. Because it will look fucking stupid if you don't finish it now, she says, relenting as well. Yes, exactly. It will look fucking stupider if I don't finish. So let me help you. So let me help, she says, and something in the emphasis she puts on the words to get gets and something in the emphasis she puts in the words gets to help get Gosh darn it, Jeff Vandermeer. Why are your sentences such nonsense? It's the page breaks. I'm sorry, the, the line breaks. The line breaks are always at the worst possible time for my brain. It's unbelievable. 
I'm so sorry. <sighs> Tantrum over. So let me help, she says, and something in the emphasis she puts on the words gets to you. Will always get to you. Let me help. All right, then, you say gruffly, and hand her the extra brush. But you're still going to dig up the dead, and you're still wondering how to change the paradigm like Lowry keeps trying to change the paradigm. Lost in the thought of that... What the blink? Oh, okay. It's another Jeff Vandermeer. Lost in the thought of that the next weekend at Chipper's while bowling, while home clipping coupons for the grocery store, while taking a bath, while going out for a ballroom dancing lesson because it's the kind of thing you would never do. So you do it, aware that if Severance has eyes on you, she'll find it evidence of being erratic but not caring. You put yourself here, set this trap for yourself, so if you feel trapped by it now, it's your own fault. The day after painting the door, Grace follows up, as she always does, unable to leave it alone, but privately, on the rooftop, which by now you're pretty sure Cheney suspects exists, just as he suspects the involvement of dark energy in the maintenance of the invisible border, Grace, saying... You have a plan, right? This is all part of a plan. I'm relying on you to have a plan. So you nod, smile, say, Yes, Grace, I have a plan. Because you don't want to betray that trust. Because what's the good of saying, All I have is a feeling, an intuition, and a brief conversation with a man who should be dead. I have a plant and a phone. In your dreams, you stand on the sidelines, holding the plant in one hand and the cell phone in the other, watching a war between Central and Area X. In some fundamental way, you feel, they have been in conflict for far longer than thirty years. For ages and ages, centuries in secret. Central, the ultimate void to counteract Area X. Impersonal, antiseptic, labyrinthine, and unknowable. Against the facade, you cannot help but express a kind of terrible betrayal. Sometimes you admire Lowry's fatal liveliness next to that, a silhouette writhing against a dull, white screen. Zero, zero, 0015 the lighthouse keeper western siren finally fixed touched up the white part of the day mark seaward side fixed the ladder too but it still feels rickety unsafe something knocked down a foot of fence and got into the garden but couldn't tell what no deer tracks but likely culprit s and s b the shadows of the abyss are like the petals of a monstrous flower didn't feel up to a hike, but seen from lighthouse grounds, of note. Flycatcher, not sure what kind. Fri frigate birds, least terns, cormorants, black-throated stilt, exclamation point, a couple of yellow throats. On beach, found a large pipefish had washed up, a few sail jellyfish rotting in the sand. There came an incandescent light. There came a star in motion, the sun plummeting to earth. There fell from the heavens a huge burning torch, thick flames dripping out behind it. And this light, this star, shook the sky and the beach where he had walked a second ago under a clear blue sky. The scorched intensity of the sudden object hurtling down toward him battered his senses, sent him sprawling to his knees as he tried to run, and then dove face first into the sand. 
He screamed as the rays, the sparks, sprayed out all around, and the core of the light hit somewhere in front of him, his teeth smashed in his mouth, his bones turned to powder. The reverberation lived within him as he tried to regain his footing, even as the impact conjured up an enormous tidal wave like a living creature aimed at the beach. When it fell upon him, the weight, the immensity, destroyed him once more and washed away anything he could have recognized, could have known. He gasped and thrashed and hurt, dug his tortured hands into the shocking, cold sand. The sand had a different texture, and the tiny creatures living there were different. He didn't want to look up, take in his surroundings, frightened that the landscape, too, might have changed, might be so different he wouldn't recognize it. The tidal waves faded. The burning lights receded. Saul managed to get to his feet, to stagger a step or two, and as he did, he realized that everything around him had been restored. The world he knew, the world he loved, tranquil, unchanged, the lighthouse up the shore undamaged by the wave. Seagulls flew by, and far in the distance someone walked, looking for shells. He brushed the sand from his shirt, his shorts, stood there for a long moment, bent over with his hands on his thighs. The impact was still affecting his hearing, still making him shake with the memory of its power. Yet it had left no evidence behind except melancholy, as if held within him the only memory of some world, lost world. As if, he held, as if he held within him the only memory of some lost world. There we go. That makes more sense. He could not stop trembling in the aftermath, wondered if he were going insane. That took less hubris than thinking this was a message from on high. For in the center of the light that had come storming down, an image had appeared. A pattern that he recognized. The eight leaves of the strange plant, each one like another spiraling step down into oblivion. I meant to change book covers at the start of that chapter. I had forgotten. My bad. Mid-morning. The rocks were slippery and sharp, encrusted with limpets and barnacles. Sea lice, ancient of days, traveled across those rocks on quests to scavenge whatever they could, and the seaweed that gathered there, in strands thin and thick and sometimes gelatinous, brought a tangy, moldy smell. It was a relief to sit there, trying to recover, peering into the tidal pool that lay at his feet as the rock dug into his posterior as he tried to control his shaking. There had been other visions, but none as powerful as this one. He had a perverse urge for Henry to appear, to confess all of his symptoms to a man who, once revealed as a passionate, delusional ghost hunter, he recalled almost with fondness. But Saul hadn't seen Henry or Suzanne since the incident in the night, nor the strange woman. Sometimes he thought he was being watched, but that was probably nothing more than a reflection of believing Henry when he said he would find it, implying a return. The tidal pool directly in front of him became frustratingly occluded when a cloud passed overhead and changed the quality of the light, or when the wind picked up and created ripples. But when the sun broke through again, and it wasn't just the reflection of his face and knees he saw, the pool became a kind of living cabinet of curiosities. He might prefer to hike, to birdwatch, but he could understand a fascination with tidal pools, too. Tidal pools, too. Fat orange starfish, either lumbering or slumbering, lay half in, half out of the water. Some bottom-dwelling fish contemplated him with a kind of bulging, jaded regard. A boxy, purse-lipped creature whose body was the same color as the sand, except for bejeweled sapphire and gold eyes. A tiny red crab sidled across that expanse, toward what to it must be a gaping chasm of a dark hole leading down, perhaps into an endless network of tiny caverns carved into the rocks over the years. If he stared long enough into the comforting oblivion of that microcosm, if it, it washed away everything else, even the shadow of his reflection, 
It was there, some minutes later, that Gloria found him, as Saul perhaps had known she would, the rocks to her what the lighthouse had become to him. She dropped down beside him as if indestructible, corduroy-clad rump sliding hardly at all on the rock surface. Not so much perched as a rock atop another rock, not so much perched as a rock atop another rock. The solid weight of her forced him to s forced him a little to the side. She was breathing hard from clamoring fast over the rocks, managed a kind of uh-huh of approval at his choice of entertainment, and he gave her a brief smile and a nod in return. For a long while they just sat together, watching. He had decided he could not talk to her about what he had seen, that pushing that onto her was wrong. The only one he could tell was Charlie, maybe. The crab sifted through something in the sand. The camouflaged fish risked a slow walk on Oh, sorry. The camouflaged fish risked a slow walk on stickery fins, like a drab half open like drab half opened fans, making for the shadow shelter of a tiny ledge of rock. One of the starfish, as if captured via time lapse photography, withdrew at a hypnotically slow speed into the water, until only the tips of two arms lay exposed and glistening. Finally, Gloria said, why are you down here and not working by the shed or in the tower? I don't feel like working today. Images from old illuminated manuscripts of comets hurtling through the sky from the books in his father's house. The reverberation and recoil of the beach exploding under his feet. The strange creatures in the sand. What messages should he what message should he take from that? Yeah, I don't always want to go to school, she said, but at least you get money. I do get money, that's true, he said, and they're never going to give you money to go to school. They should give me money. I have to put up with a lot. He wondered just how much. It might well be a lot. School's important, he said, because he felt he should say it, as if Gloria's mother stood right behind them, tapping her foot. Gloria considered that a moment, nudged him in the ribs in a way as familiar as if they were drinking buddies down at the village bar. I told my mom this is a school too, but I told my mom this is a school too, but that didn't work. What's this? The tidal pools, the forest, the trails, all of it. Most of the time it's true I'm just goofing off, but I'm learning things too. Saul could imagine how that conversation had gone. You're not going to get any grades here, warming to the idea, although I guess the bears might give you grades for watching out for them. She kind of leaned back to get a better look at him, as if reappraising him. That's stupid. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, this whole conversation is stupid. Are you f still feeling different? What? No. No, I'm fine, Gloria. They watched the fish for a bit after that. Something about their conversation, the way they'd moved too fast or been too loud, had made the fish retreat into the sand, so now only its eyes looked up at them. There are things the lighthouse teaches me, though, Gloria said, wrenching Saul out of his thoughts. To stand up tall, straight and tall, and project light out of your head toward the sea? She giggled at that, giving him too much credit for an answer he'd meant as he'd meant at least half ironically. No, here's what the lighthouse teaches me. Be quiet and let me tell you. The lighthouse teaches me to work hard, to keep my room clean, to be honest, and to be nice to people. Then, reflecting, looking down at her feet, my room is a mess and I lie sometimes and I'm not always nice to people, but that's the idea. A little embarrassed, he said, That fish down there sure is frightened of you. Huh? It just doesn't know me. If it knew me, that fresh would shake that fish would shake my hand. I don't think there's anything you could say to convince it of that, and there are all kinds of ways you could hurt it without meaning to. Watching those unblinking blue eyes with the gold streaks, the dark vertical pupil, that seemed that seemed like a 
that seemed like a fundamental truth. Ignoring him. You like being a lighthouse keeper, don't you, Saul? Saul. That was a new thing. When did they become Saul and Gloria rather than Mr. Evans and Gloria? Why, do you want my job when you grow up? No, I never want to be a lighthouse keeper, shoveling and making tomatoes and climbing all the time. Was that how it seemed he spent his time? He guessed it did. At least you're honest. Yep, Mom says I should be less honest. There's that, too. His father could have been less honest, because less honesty was often ju because honesty was often just a way of being cruel. Anyway, I can't stay long. There was real regret in her voice. A shame, given how honest you're being. I know, right? But I gotta go. Mom's going to come by in the car soon. We're driving down to meet my dad. We're driving into town to meet my dad. Oh, so he's picking you up for the holidays? So this was the day. A shadow had passed over the tidal pool again, and all he could see were their two faces peering down. He could have passed for her father, couldn't he? Or was he too old? But such thoughts were a form of weakness. It's longer this time, she said, clearly not happy about it. My mom wants me up there for a couple of months at least, because she's lost her second job and needs to look for another one. But that's only eight weeks, or maybe sixty days. He looked over at her, saw the serious expression on her face. Two months. That was an impossibly long time. You'll have fun. When you get back, you'll appreciate this place even more. I appreciate it now, and it won't be fun. Dad's girlfriend is a bitch. Don't use that word. Sorry, but she is. Did your mom say that? No, I made it up myself. It wasn't hard. Well, try to get along, Saul said, having reached the end of any advice a lighthouse could convey. It's just for a little while. Sure, and then I'll be back. Help me up. I think my mom's here. He couldn't hear a car, but that didn't mean anything. He took her hand, braced himself so she could lean on him and get to her feet. She stood there, balanced against him, hand on his shoulder, and said, "'Goodbye, Saul. Save this tidal pool for me.' "'I'll put up a sign,' he tried to smile. She nodded, and then she was gone, scampering across the rocks like some kind of deranged daredevil, showing off. On impulse, he turned and shouted, "'Hey, Gloria!' at her, before she was out of earshot. She turned, balanced with both arms outstretched, waiting. Don't forget about me! Take care of yourself! He tried to make it sound without weight, sentences that could float away into the air. Nothing that mattered. She nodded and waved, and said something he couldn't hear, and then she was running up, out, up the lighthouse lawn and around the curve of the lighthouse wall, out of sight. Below, the fish had its mouth around the small red crab, which was struggling in a slow, meditative way, almost like it didn't want to get free. Zero zero sixteen, Ghost Bird. The lighthouse rose from fog and reflections like a mirror of itself. The beach gray and cold, the sand rasping against the hull of the boat as they abandoned it in the shadow shallows. The waves came in small came in small and half curling like the froth of malformed questions. The lighthouse did not resemble Ghost Bird's memory of it, for its sides had been scoured by fire. Discoloration extended all the way to the top, where the lens, the light within, lay extinguished. The fire had erupted from the landing windows as well, and in combination with the bits of broken glass and all the other talismans human beings had rendered up over, uh, had rendered up to it over the years, gave the lighthouse the appearance of something shamanistic. 
reduced now to a day mark for their boat, the simplest of its functions, the one task that, unperformed, made a lighthouse no longer of use to anyone, made it into a narrow, haunted redoubt. Redoubt. Burned by the border commander, Grace had told them. Burned because they didn't understand it, and the journals with it. But Ghostbird caught the hesitation in Grace's voice, how she still would not tell them exactly what had happened within the lighthouse, what slaughter and deception consisted of, any detailed accounting of what had come at them from the seaward side. All Grace could offer in its place was a localized pathology, the origin of the orange flags, the doing of the border commander, a cataloging of all that was unknowable to her. Perhaps the commander had been trying to keep separate the real from the imagined. If so, she had failed. Even common thistles had been so marked. Given more time, the commander might have marked her in marked the entire world. Ghostbird had a vision of the journals impervious, still up there, reconstituted. Were they now to enter, walk up into the lantern room, undo the trap door, stare down as had the biologist, as had she so many years ago? Would the reflected light from those frozen accounts irradiate their thoughts, contaminate their dreams, forever trap them? Or was there just a mountain of ashes in there now? Ghostbird did not want to find out. It was late afternoon already. They had left the island in the early morning, in a bigger boat Grace had hidden out of sight of the pier. The biologist had not reappeared, although Control had searched those waters with a kind of nervous anxiety. Ghostbird would have sensed her presence long before there was any danger. She could not tell him, for his own sake, that the oceans through which the biologist now traveled were wider and deeper than the one that led them to the lighthouse. They trudged up the beach toward the lighthouse, taking a path that minimized the possibility of sniper fire from above. Grace believed everyone was dead, or long since had moved on, but there was always the chance. Nothing arose from the seaward side, ghost-like or otherwise. Things came out of the sea, things like the biologist, but less kind. From the lip of the dunes, they came, to, they came up to the level ground next to the lighthouse without incident, lingered at the edge of the overgrown, long wild lawn beside it, where nettleweed and snarls of blackberry plants grew, a thorny thicket for them, but a natural shelter for the wrens and sparrows that darted betwixt, between, their, chill, their cheerful song a discordant element against the overcast quality of the light. The ever-present thistles looked to Ghost Bird like some kind of natural microphone, the stickery domes there to pick up and transmit sound instead of disseminate seeds. A broken door yawned, beckoned to them with darkness, while the gray sky above, the way it could glint or waver at odd moments, made control in particular jittery. He could not stand still, did not want Ghost Bird or Grace standing still, either. Ghostbird could see the brightness flaring out from him like a halo of jagged knives, wondered if he would still be himself by the time they reached the tower. Perhaps he would, if nothing preternatural stitched its way through that sky. No point in going up, Grace said. Not even the least bit curious? Do you like walking through charnel houses and cemeteries, too? Do you like walking through charnel houses and cemeteries, too? still evaluating her, and Ghost Bird unable to tell what she was thinking. Had Grace thrown in her lot with them, hoping Ghost Bird was indeed a secret weapon, or for some other purpose? What did she know? What she did know, sorry, what she did know was that with Grace there'd ha there had... Uh... What she did know was that with Grace there... We did it again. What she did know, was that with Grace there, she'd had little time to talk to Control in private. Any conversations were of necessity between the three of them. This disturbed her, because she knew Grace 
even less than she knew control. I don't want to go up, Control said. I don't. I want to cover the open ground as fast as, po as fast as possible. Get to where we're going as fast as possible. At least no one appears to be here, Grace said. At least it appears as if Area X may have thinned out the opposition. Yes, that was good, if a cold thing to say. But the look Control gave Grace indicated he could not jettison some essential sentimentality that was of no use here, some mechanism that belonged to the world outside. Well, let me add to the collection, Grace said, and tossed the biologist's island account and her journal through the open front door. Control stared into that darkness as if she had committed a terrible act that he was thinking of setting right. But Ghostbird knew that Grace was just trying to set them free. Sorry about that. Never has a setting been so able to live without the souls traversing it. A sentence Ghostbird remembered from a college text, one that had lingered with the biologist after her transition to the city, come back to her as she stood in the empty lot, following the silent launch of a sugar glider from one telephone pole to another. The text had been referring to urban landscapes, but the biologist had interpreted it as implying to the as applying to the natural world, or at least what could be interpreted as wilderness, or at least what could be interpreted as wilderness, even though human beings had so transformed the world that even Area X had not been able to completely reduce those signs and symbols. The shrubs and trees that constituted invasive species were only one part of that. The other, how even the faint outline of a human-made path changed the topography of a place. The only solution to the environment is neglect, which requires our collapse. A sentence the biologist had excised from her thesis, but one that had burned bright in her mind, and now in ghost birds, where, even analyzed and kept at arm's length like all received memories, it had a kind of power. In the presence of the memory of a thousand eyes staring up at her. As they headed inland, the larger things fell away, revealing the indelible. The dark line of a marsh hawk flying low over the water, the delicate fractures in the water where a water moccasin swam, the strangely satisfying long grass that cascaded like hair from the ground. She was content with silence, but grace and control were less so. I miss hot showers, Control said. I miss not itching all over. Boil water, Grace said, as if it provided the solution to both problems. As if Control's misses were wishes, and he should think bigger. Not the same thing. I miss standing on the roof of the Southern Reach and looking out over the forest, Grace said. You used to do that? How did you get up there? The janitor let us uh, go up. The director and me. We would stand up there and make our plans. The, that catch in Grace's throat, that invisible connection, Ghostbird contemplated it. What did she miss? There had been so little time to miss anything. Their conversation existed so apart from her that she wondered again what she might do when she met the crawler. What if she was a sleeper cell for a cause much older than either the Southern Reach or Area X? Did her allegiance lie with the former director, or the director as a child, playing on those black rocks near the lighthouse? And what master did the lighthouse keeper serve? It would have been better if she could have thought of each person in the equation as just one thing, but none of them were that simple. Perhaps the biologist's final response was the only response that mattered, and her entire letter a sop to expectations, to the reaction human beings were hardwired to have. 
a kind of final delay before she had come before she had come to embody that correct answer perhaps so many journals had piled up in the lighthouse because on some level most came in time to recognize the futility of language not just in connection for which words were such a sorrowful disappointment so in, so inadequate an expression of both the finite and the infinite even as the crawler wrote out its terrible message none of that made syntactic sense i'm sorry i messed that up i'm going to reread that paragraph see run on sentences make this tough mr vandermeer not all of them are run-on sentences. It's just hard to read. Perhaps the biologist's final response was the only response that mattered, and her entire letter a sop to expectations, to the reaction human beings were hardwired to have. A kind of final delay before she had come to embody that correct answer? Perhaps so many journals had piled up in the lighthouse because on some level most came, in time, to recognize the futility of language. Not just in Area X, but against the rightness of the lived-in moment, the instant of touch, of connection, for which words were such a sorrowful disappointment, so inadequate as an expression of both the finite and the infinite, even as the crawler wrote out its terrible message. Back on the island, there had been one last unanswerable question, and the weight of it had settled over each of them in different ways. If they now traversed a landscape transplanted from somewhere far remote, then what existed within the coordinates of the real Area X back on Earth? Grace had put forward the idea, had clearly been thinking about it, possibly for years now, haunted and frustrated by it. We are! Control had replied, distant, coming to her from afar with an unfocused stare. We are. We are. That's where we are. Although he wasn't stupid, must know Grace was right. If you go through the door, you come to Area X, Grace said. If you walk across the border, you go to the other place, wherever it is. Grace's tone did not admit to doubt, or that she cared whether they believed her or not, an essential indifference to questions, as if Area X had worn her down. A pragmatism that meant she knew the conclusions she had reached would please no one. But Ghostbird knew what she had seen in the corridor leading to Area X, leading into Area X, the detritus and trash, she, the, and trash she had seen there, the bodies, and wondered if it might be real, and not summoned from her mind. Wondered what might have come through the twenty-foot door that Control had described to her, the door lost to them. What might still come through such a door? And her thought, nothing. Because if so, it would have happened long ago. The marsh lakes had become such deep, perfect, such a deep, perfect blue that in... Uh, we did it again. The marsh lakes had become such a deep, perfect blue in that uncertain light that the reflections of the surrounding scrub forest on that surface seemed as real as their root-bound doppelgangers. Their mud-encrusted boots churned up amid the rich sediment and plant roots a smell almost like crisp hay. Control leaned against Ghostbird more than once to keep his balance, almost pulling her down in the process. Ahead of them now came the smell of burning, and from above something the others could not see stitched its way through the overcast sky, and Ghostbird was not surprised. Zero zero seventeen, the director. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Once, <laughs> once, 
One spring day at the Southern Reach, you're taking a break, pacing across the courtyard tiles as you worry at a problem in your head, and you see something strange out by the swamp lake. At the edge of the black water, a figure squats, hunched over, hands you cannot see busy at some mysterious task. Your first impulse is to call security, but then you recognize the slight frame, the tuft of dark hair. It's Whitby, in his brown blazer, his navy slacks, his dress shoes. Whitby playing in the mud. Washing something? Strangling something? The level of concentration he displays, even at this distance, is of working on something that requires a jeweler's precision. Instinct tells you to be quiet, to walk slow, to take care with fallen branches and dead leaves. Whitby has been startled enough in the past, by the past, and you want your presence known by degrees. Halfway there, though, he turns long enough to acknowledge you and go back to what he's doing, and you walk faster after that. The trees are as sullen as ever, looking like hunched-over priests with long beards of moss, or, as Grace says, less respectfully, like a line of used-up old drug addicts. The water carries only the small, patient ripples made by Whitby, and your reflection, as you come close and lean over his shoulder, is distorted by widening rings and wavery gray light. Whitby is washing a small brown mouse. He holds the mouse, careful but firm, between the thumb and index finger of his left hand, the mouse's head and front legs circled by this fleshy restraint, the pale belly, back legs, and tail splayed out across his palm. The mouse seems hypnotized, or for some other reason preternaturally calm, while Whitby, with his cupped right hand, ladles water onto the mouse, then extends his little finger and rubs the water into the fur of the underbelly, the sides, then the furry cheeks, followed by anointment of the top of the head. Whitby has draped a little white towel across his left forearm. It is monogrammed with a large cursive W in gold thread. Brought from home? He pinches the towel from his forearm and, using a single corner, delicately daubs the top of the mouse's head while its tiny black eyes stare off into the distance. There's a kind of febrile extremity of care here, as Whitby proceeds to wipe off one pink-clawed paw and then the other, before moving to the back paws and the thin tail. Whitby's hand is so pale and small that there is a sort of symmetry on display, an absurd yet somehow touching suggestion of a shared ancestry. It has been four months since the last member of the last 11th expedition died of cancer, six weeks since you had them exhumed. It has been more than two years since you came back across the border with Whitby. Over the past seven or eight months, you have had a sense of Whitby recovering, Fewer transfer requests, more engagement in status meetings, a revival of, of self-interest in his combined theories document, which he now calls a thesis on terroir, evoking a comprehensive ecosystem approach based on an advanced theory of wine production. There has been nothing in the execution of his duties to indicate anything more than his usual eccentricity. Even Cheney has, grudgingly, admitted this, and you don't care that the man often uses Whitby as a wedge against you now. You don't care about reasons so long as it brings Whitby back closer to the center of things. What do you have there, Whitby? Breaking the silence is sudden and intrusive. Nothing you say will sound like anything other than an adult talking to a child, but Whitby's put you in that position. Whitby stops watching, stops washing and drying the mouse, throws the towel over his left shoulder, stares at the mouse, examining it as if there might still be a spot of dirt here or there. A mouse, he says, as if it should be obvious. Where did you find her? Him, in the attic. I found him in the attic. His tone like someone about to be reprimanded, but defiant, too. Oh, at home? Bringing the safety of home to the dangerous place, the workplace, in physical form. You're trying to suppress the psychologist in you, not overanalyze, but it's difficult. 
in the attic. Why did you bring him out here? To wash him. You don't mean for it to seem like an interrogation, but you're sure it does. Is this a bad thing or a good thing in the progression of Whitby's recovery? There is no base score assigned to owning a mouse or washing a mouse that can confer an automatic rating of fit or unfit for duty. You couldn't wash him inside? Whitby gives you an upturned sideways glance. You're still stooping. He's still hunched. That water's contaminated. Contaminated? An interesting choice of words. But you use it, don't you? Yes, I do. Relenting, giving in a little, relaxing so that you're less concerned he's going to strangle the mouse by accident. But I thought maybe he'd like to be outside for a while. It's a nice day. Translation. Whitby needed a break, just like you needed a break, pacing the courtyard tiles. What's his name? He doesn't have a name. He doesn't have a name? No. Somehow this bothers you more than the washing, but it's an unease you can't put into words. Well, he's a handsome mouse. Which sounds stupid even as you say it, but you're at a loss. Don't talk to me like I'm an idiot he says. I'm aware this looks strange, but think about th some of the things you do for stress. You'd gone across the border with this man. You'd sacrificed his peace of mind on the altar of your insatiable fascination, your curiosity, and your ambition. He doesn't deserve condescension on top of that. Sorry. You awkwardly lower yourself in the dead leaves and half-dried mud next to him. The truth is, you don't want to go back inside yet, and Whitby doesn't seem to want to either. The only excuse I've got is that it's been a long day. Already. It's okay, Whitby says after a pause, and returns to cleaning his mouse. Then volunteers. I've had him about five weeks. I had a dog and a cat growing up, but no pets since. You've tried to imagine what Whitby's house looks like, and failed. You can only imagine an endless white space with white, modern furniture, and a computer screen in the corner as the only spot of color. Which probably means Whitby's house is an opulent, decadent, free-for-all of styles and periods, all offered up in bright, saturated colors. The plant bloomed, Whitby says into the middle of your musings. The sentence has no meaning at first. But when it takes on meeting, you sit up straighter. Whitby looks over at you. There's no emergency. It's already over. You're quelling the impulse to pull Whitby to his feet and march him back inside to show you what no emergency means. Explain, you say, putting just enough pressure on the word to hold it there like an egg about to crack. Be specific. It happened in the middle of the night. Last night, he says. Everyone else had left. I work very late sometimes, and I like to spend time in the storage cathedral. He looks away, continues as if you've asked him something. I just like it in there. It calms me down. And? And last night I came in and I just decided to check on the plant. Said too casually, as if he always checked on the plant. And there was a flower. The plant was blooming, but it's gone now. It all happened very fast. It's important to keep to just keep talking, to keep Whitby calm and answering your questions. How long? Maybe an hour. If I had thought it would disintegrate, I would have called someone. What did the blossom look like? Like an ordinary flower, with seven or eight petals, translucent, almost white. Did you take any photographs? Any video? Did you take any photographs? Any video? No, he says. I thought it would still be there for a while. I didn't tell anyone because it's gone. Or because, with no evidence, it would be more evidence against him, against his state of mind, his suitability, when he is just now getting out from under that reputation. What did you do, then? He shrugs, the mouse's tail twitching. 
as he transfers the animal to his right hand. I scheduled a purification, just to be sure, and I left. You were in a suit the whole time, right? Sh sure. Yes, of course. No strange readings? No, no strange readings. I checked. And nothing else I need to know? Like the possible connection between the plant having bloomed and Whitby, the next day, coming out here with his mouse. Nothing you don't already know? A shade defiant again, a lifting of his gaze to tell you he's thinking about the trip into Area X, the one that he can't tell anyone about, the one that made him unreliable to the rest of the staff. How to evaluate hallucinations that might be real? A paranoia that might be justified? Right after you came back, you remember Whitby saying wistfully to himself, as if something had been lost, They didn't notice us at first, but then, gradually, they begin to peer in at us, because we just couldn't stop. You get to your feet, look down at Whitby, say, Give me a more extensive report on the plant, from my eyes only, and you cannot keep sneaking a mouse into the building, Whitby. For one thing, security will catch on eventually. Take it home. Whitby and the mouse are both looking up at you now. Whitby harder to read than the mouse, which just wants to get out of Whitby's grasp and be on its way. I'll keep him in the attic, Whitby says. Do that. And thus, the transition to really creepy Whitby from the previous book is well on its way. Back inside, you visit the storage cathedral, putting on a purification suit so you don't contaminate the, that environment or it doesn't contaminate you. You find the plant, which has a false tag that designates it as belonging to the first eighth expedition. You examine the plant, the area around it, the floor, searching for any evidence of a dried-up flower. You find none, just a residue beside it that later comes back from testing as pine resin, from some other sample that had sat there previously. You look at those test results in your office, and you wonder if the plant had only blossomed in Whitby's mind, and, if so, what that meant. Wonder for a good long while before the thought becomes buried in the memos and the meeting minutes and the phone calls and a million minor emergencies. Should you ask Whitby if the mouse came with him into the storage cathedral? Perhaps. But what you do instead is put the immortal plant under the round-the-clock surveillance. Sorry. But what you do instead is put the immortal plant under round-the-clock surveillance, even though both Cheney and Grace give you grief about it. Whitby just needs a companion. Whitby needs someone who won't judge or interrogate him, someone or something that depends on him. And as long as Whitby keeps the creature at home, in the attic, you won't tell anyone about the breach. Have recognized by now that just as Lowry's tethered to you, you're chained to Whitby. Playing pool with the realtor and the veteran on an expedition to the Star Lanes a week later, you're listening to the realtor describe some couple that had been squatting in a model home and refused to give her the names when you think about when and refuse to give her their names when you think again about Whitby not naming the mouse. As if he'd been following Southern Reach protocol for expeditions. They thought that so long as I didn't know their names, I couldn't call the police, peering out from behind the curtains like ghosts. There was so much fa f there was so much fail in that, not that I felt good about kicking them out. Except I have to sell the place. I'm not some I'm not running a charity. I give to charities, sure, but why do they have some why do they have homeless shelters any Oh my gosh, let's take this from the top. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got lost in the sauce there. I got lost. The words just stopped meaning anything halfway through the paragraph. <laughs> it was just like, this is this is pure Chinese room territory. I'm just reading out sounds. None of them mean anything. I'm sorry. My bad. This always happens at the end of a chapter. Why is that? 
They thought that so long as I didn't know their names, I couldn't call the police, peering out from behind the curtains like ghosts. There was so much fail in that, not that I felt good about kicking them out. Except I have to sell the place. I'm not running a charity. I give to charities, sure, but why do they have homeless shelters anyway? And if I let them stay some and if I let them stay, then someone else might get the same idea. Turns out the police had a file on them, so I made the right decision. Waiting there, back on your desk at the Southern Reach, you already have the files of candidates for a twelfth expedition. Right on top is the most promising, to your mind, an antisocial biologist whose husband went on the last eleventh. Zero zero eighteen, the lighthouse keeper. Secured the lighthouse, worked on the illegible, fixed things, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Came then the crying call of a curlew, and at dawn too, I heard the hooting of an owl, the yap of foxes. Just a little ways up from the lighthouse, where I strayed for a bit, a bear cub poked its head out of the underbrush, looking around like any child might. Like any child might. At the hand, and the hand of the sinner shall rejoice, for there is no sin in shadow or in light that the seeds of the dead cannot forgive. By the time Saul made it to the village bar, everyone had already crammed inside, anticipating music by a few locals who called themselves the Monkey's Elbow. The deck, with its great view of the darkening ocean, was empty. It was too cold, for one thing, and he hurried inside with anticipation. He'd felt better with each day since the hallucination on the beach, and no one from the Light Brigade had returned to plague him. His temperature had receded, along with the pressure in his head, and with it the urge to burden Charlie with his problems. He hadn't dreamed for three nights. Even his hearing was fine, the moment his ears had popped like getting a jolt to his system. Yeah, no, I read that correctly. Even his hearing was fine, the moment his ears had, po had popped like getting a jolt to his system, more energetic in every way. So everything seemed normal, as if he'd worried over nothing, and all he missed was the familiar sight of Gloria coming down the beach toward the lighthouse, or climbing on the rocks, or loitering near the shed. Charlie had even promised to meet him at the bar for a short while before he went out night fishing again. Despite the rough schedule, he seemed happy to be making money, but they'd hardly seen each other in several days. Old Jim, old Jim, with his ruddy beacon of a face and fuzzy white mutton-chop sideburns, had commandeered the rickety upright piano in the far corner of the main room. Monkey's elbow was, warn was warming up around him, a discordant ramble of violin, accordion, acoustic guitar, and tambourine. The piano, a sea salvage, had been restored to its former undrowned glory. Mother of Pearl inlay preserved on the lid, but still retained a wheezy, tinny tone from its baptism, sagging and soggy on some of the keys, according to old Jim. The place smelled comfortingly of cigarettes and greasy fried fish, and some underlying hint of too sweet honey. The oysters were fresh caught, and the beers, served out of a cooler, were cheap. Saul always forgot the downside real quick. There was good cheer to be found here, if sometimes grudgingly given. Any prayers he offered up came from knowing that no health inspector had ever journeyed to the tiny kitchen, or the grill out back where the seagulls gathered with irrepressible hope. <clears throat> Excuse me. Charlie was already there, had gotten them a little round table with two stools that hugged the wall opposite the piano. Saul pushed through the press of bodies maybe sixty people, practically a mob by forgotten coast standards, and gave Charlie a squeeze of the shoulder before sitting. "'Hello there, stranger,' Saul said, making it sound like an even worse pickup line than it would have been. 
Someone's in a better mood, Jack, Charlie said, then caught himself. I mean, I don't know any Jack, unless you mean Jack shit, Saul said. No, I know what you mean, and I am. I feel a lot better. First evidence from Charlie that he had been dragged down by Saul's condition, which just deepened his affection for Charlie. He'd not complained once during all of Saul's moaning about his lethargy and symptoms, had only tried to help. Maybe they could get back to normal once this night-fishing expedition came to its end. "'Good, good,' Charlie said, smiling and looking around. Still a little extra stutter-step of awkwardness from him when out in public. "'How was the fishing yesterday?' Charlie'd said something about a good catch, but they hadn't talked long. "'Best haul so far!' Charlie said, his face lit up. A lot of skates and rays and flounder, some mullet and bass. Charlie get, got played a flat rate per hour, but a bonus for catches over a certain weight. Anything odd? A question Saul always asked. He liked hearing about strange sea creatures. Lately, thinking about what Henry had said, he took a special interest in the answer. Only a couple of things. Threw them both back as they were so ugly. Some weird fish and a kind of sea squirt that looked like it was spewing blood. Fair enough. Fair enough. You look a lot better, you know. Calm at the lighthouse. Which was Charlie's way of saying, Tell me why on the phone you said, Not a lot of fun around here recently. Saul was about to launch into the story of his final confrontation with Henry and the Light Brigade when the piano cut off and old Jim got up and introduced Monkey's Elbow, even though everybody already knew them. The band members were Sadie Dawkins, Betsy Pepin, and his erstwhile lighthouse volunteer, Brad. They all worked at the village bar on and off. Trudy, Gloria's mother, was on tambourine, the guest spot. Saul's turn would come some day. Monkey's Elbow lurched into some sad, thick song, the sea's bounty on display in its lyrics, and two ill-fated lovers, and a tragic hill overlooking a secret cove. The usual, but not so much shanty as... Uh, the usual, but not so much shanty as influenced by what Charlie called sand-encrusted sea hippies, who had popularized a laid-back, listener-friendly kind of folk pop. Saul liked it live, even if Brad tended to ham it up a bit. But Charlie stared at his drink with a kind of purse-lipped frown, then rolled his eyes secretively at Saul, while Saul shook his head in mock disapproval. Sure, they weren't great, but any performance took guts. He, took, he used to throw up before sermons, which might have been a sign from God, now that he thought about it. The worst nights, Saul had done push-ups beforehand and jumping jacks to sweat out the fear of performance. Charlie leaned in, and Saul met him halfway. Charlie said in his ear, You know that fire on the island? Yeah. A friend of mine was out there fishing that day, and he saw bonfires. People burning papers for hours, like you said. But when he came back around, they loaded a bunch of boxes into motorboats. You want to know where those boats headed? Out to sea? No, due west, hugging the coast. Interesting. The only thing due west of Failure Island, besides mosquito-infested inlets, were a couple of small towns and the military base. Saul sat back, just staring at Charlie, with Charlie nodding at him like, I told you so, although what he meant by that, Saul didn't know. Told you they were strange? Told you they were up to no good? The second song played out more like a traditional folk song, slow and deep, carrying along the baggage of a century or two of prior interpretations. The third was a rollicking but silly number, another original, this time about a crab that lost its shell and was traveling all over the place to find it. A few couples were dancing now. His ministry hadn't been one of those that banned dancing or other earthly pleasures, but he'd never learned either but he'd never learned, either. Dancing was Saul's secret fantasy, something he thought he'd enjoy but had to file under too late now. Charlie'd never dance anyway, maybe not even in private. 
Sadie came by during a short break between songs. She worked in a bar in Headley during the summers, and she always had funny stories about the customers, many of them coming off the river walk, drunk as a skunk. Trudy came over, too, and they talked for a while, although not directly about Gloria. More about Gloria's dad, during which Saul gathered that Gloria and her dad had made it back to his place by now. So that was all right. Then they mostly just listened, stealing moments between songs to talk or grab another beer. In scanning the room for people he knew, people he might give a nod to, claim a bond with, he'd felt for a while now not like the one watching, but the one being watched. He put it down to some receding symptom of his non-condition, or to Charlie's skittishness rubbing off on him. But then, through the murky welter of bodies, the rising tide of loud conversations, the frenetic playing of the band, he spied an unwelcome figure across the room, near the door. Henry. He stood perfectly still, watching, without even a drink in his hand. Henry wore that ridiculous silk shirt and pretentious slacks, pressed just so, and yet, curiously, he blended in against the wall, as if he belonged there. No one but Saul seemed to notice him. That Suzanne wasn't with him struck Saul hard for some reason. It, that, it made him resist the urge to turn to Charlie and point Henry out to him. That's the man who broke into my lighthouse a few nights ago. The whole time Saul stared at Henry, the edges of the room had been growing darker and darker, and the sickly sweet smell intensified, and everyone around Henry grew more and more insubstantial, vague, unknowable silhouettes, and all the light came to Henry and gathered around him and spilled back out from him. A kind of vertigo washed over Saul, as if a vast pit had opened up beneath him and he was suspended above it, about to fall. There came back all of the old symptoms he'd thought were gone, as if they'd just been hiding. There was a comet dripping fire through his head, trailing flame down his back. While the band kept playing through the darkness, their sound curdling into a song sung far too slow, and before they could vanish into a darkly glinting spiral, before everything not Henry could disappear, Saul gripped the table with both hands and looked away. The chatter, the rush and realignment of conversations came back, and the light came back, and the band sounded normal again, and Charlie was talking to him like nothing had happened. Saul's sense of relief so palpable, the blood within him was rushing too hard, and he felt faint. When, after stabilizing a minute, he dared sneak a, gl sneak a glance toward where Henry had stood, the man had vanished, and someone else stood in his place. Someone Saul didn't know, who raised his beer to Saul awkwardly, so that he realized he'd been staring across the room for too long. "'Did you hear what I said?' Charlie, in a voice loud enough to cut through the band. Are you okay? Reaching out to touch Saul's wrist, which meant he was concerned and that Saul had been acting odd. Saul smiled and nodded. The song ended, and Charlie said, It wasn't the stuff about the boats and the island, was it? It was nothing. I wasn't trying to worry you. No, not that. Nothing like that. I'm fine touched because it was the kind of thing that might have secretly bothered Charlie if their roles had been reversed. And you'd tell me if you were feeling sick again. Of course I would. Half lying, trying to process what he'd just experienced. And, serious, struck by some form of premonition. But, Charlie, I hate to say it, you should probably leave now or you'll be late. Charlie took that in stride, already half off his stool because he didn't like the music anyway. See you tomorrow, then, Charlie said, giving him a wink and a long last stare that wasn't entirely innocent. Somehow, Charlie looked so good in that moment, putting on his jacket. Saul clasped him tight before he could get away. The weight of the man in his arms. The feel of Charlie's rough shave that he loved so much. The tart surprise of Charlie's lip balm against his cheek held him for an extra moment, trying to preserve all of it as a bulwark against whatever had just happened. Then, too soon, Charlie was gone, 
out the door, into the night, headed for the boat. Thank you for tuning in, Neil Mohan Bankira. I appreciate it. I'm not sure what you're saying there. C H O F. Face orange frowning. I apologize. I don't always see these when they come in. Chapter 0019 Control. The night was full of white rabbits streaking across the sky instead of the stars, the moon, and Control knew that was wrong in some fevered part of his mind, some compartment holding out against the inquisitive brightness. Were they white rabbits, or were they smudges of black motion rendered as photonegatives impeding his vision? Because he didn't want to see what was there because the biologist had unlocked something inside of him, and he returned now sometimes to the phantasmagorical art in Whitby's strange room in the southern reach, and then to his theory that to disappear into the border was to enter some purgatory where you would find every lost and forgotten thing. All of the rabbits herded across that invisible barrier. Every beached destroyer and truck from the night Area X had been created. The missing in action from the expeditions. The thought, a kind of annihilating abyss. Yet there was also the light blossoming from the place below the crawler, detailed in the biologist's journal account. Where led that light? Trying to pick out from all of those pieces what might be a reasonable, even an honorable choice. One that his father would have agreed with. He no longer thought, of, thought much of his mother, or what she might think. Maybe I just wanted to be left alone, to remain in the little house on the hill in Headley, with his cat Chory and the chittering bats at night, not so far from where he had grown up, even if now so distant. It wouldn't have made a difference, Grace. The three of them sleeping on the pine moss, the moist grass, less than a mile from the topographical anomaly, their final approach planned for the morning. What wouldn't? gentle, perhaps even kind, which let him know the full manifestation of his distress. Kept seeing the biologist's many eyes, which became stars, which became the leaping white lights, which became a chessboard with his father's last move frozen there, along with Control's own last move still forthcoming. If you had told me everything, back at the Southern Reach, no, it wouldn't have. Ghostbird slept beside him, and this, too, helped him chart his decline. She slept at his back, guarding him, and with her arms wrapped tight around him. He was secure there, safe, and he loved her more for allowing that now, when she had less and less reason to. Or no reason at all. The night had turned chilly and deep, and crowded at the edges with creatures staring in at them, just dark shapes, silent and motionless. But he didn't mind them. Things his dad had said, st things his dad had said to him, st <laughs> I'm sorry. Things da his dad had said to him stuck with him more clearly now, because they must have happened. His dad w was saying to him, If you don't know your passion, it confuses your mind, not your heart. In a moment of honesty, after he had failed in the field, and he could only talk to his dad in riddles about it, never tell him the truth. Sometimes you need to know when to go on to the next thing, for the sake of other people. The chill in that. The next thing. What was his next thing here? What was his passion? He didn't know the answer to either question, knew only that there was comfort in the scratchiness of the pine needles against his face, and the sleep-drenched, smoky smell of the dirt beneath him. Hmm. 
Morning came, and he huddled in Ghostbird's arms until she stirred, disengaged from him in a way that felt too final. Among the reeds, endless marsh, and mud, there came a suggestion on the horizon of burning, and a popping and rattling that could have been gunfire or some lingering memory of past conflict playing out in his head. Yet still the blue heron in the estuary stalked tadpoles and tiny fish. The black vulture soared on the thermals high above. There came a thousand rustlings among the islands of trees. Behind them, on the horizon, the lighthouse could be seen, might always be seen, even through the fog that came with the dawn, here noncommittal and diffuse, there thick, rising like a natural defense where needed, a test and blessing against that landscape. To appreciate any of this was Ghostbird's gift to him, as if it had seeped into him through her touch. But the unnatural world intruded, as it always did, so long as will and purpose existed, and for a moment he resented that. Ghostbird and Grace were debating what to do if they encountered any remnants of the border commander's troops, debating what to do when they reached the tower. You and I go down, Grace said, and control can guard the entrance. This last stand, this hopeless task. I should go down alone, Ghostbird said, and you both, sh and you should both stand guard above. That would be against expedition protocols, Grace said. That's what you want to invoke here, now? What's left to invoke? Grace asked. I go down alone, Ghostbird said, and Grace gave her no answer. Tactical, not strategic a phrase rising out of his back catalogue of favorites. It seemed as obsolete as any of the rest, like the enormous frame of an old-fashioned bicycle. He kept glancing up at that murky sky, waiting for the heavens to fall away and reveal their true position. But the mimicry remained in place, almost convincing. What if the biologist had been wrong? What if the biologist in her writings had been a calmly raving lunatic? And then just a monster. What then? They broke camp, used a stand of swamp trees as initial cover, and surveyed the marsh, stared across the water of the estuaries. The smoke now billowed up at a sharp sixty-degree angle to add its own ash-silver roiling to the fog and form a heavier, weighted blankness. This alliance obscured the last of the blue sky and accentuated the crackling line of fires at the horizon parallel to them, waves of orange thrust upward from golden centers. The pewter stillness of the channel of water in the foreground reflected the lines of the flames and the billowing of the smoke, reflected the nearest reeds, too, and doubled by reflection also the island that at its highest point showcased island oaks and palmetto trees, their trunks white lines lost in patches of fog. There came shouting and screaming and gunfire, all too near, all from the island of trees, or, perhaps, something Lowry had placed in his head. Something that had happened here long ago, and only something happened something that had happened here long ago, only now coming to the surface. There we go, sorry about that. Control kept his eyes on the reflection, where men and women in military uniforms attacked one another, while some impossible thing watched from the watery sky. At such a remove, distorted, it did not seem so harsh, so visceral. They are already somewhere else. Control said, although he knew Grace and Ghostbird wouldn't understand. They were already in the reflection, through which an alligator now swam, where swooped through the trees, oblivious, a flicker. So they continued on, him with his sickness that he no longer wanted diagnosed, Grace with her limp, and Ghostbird keeping her own counsel. There was nothing to be done, and no reason to. Their path would skirt the fire.
In Control's imagination, the entrance to the topographical anomaly was enormous, mixed with the biologist's vast bulk in his thoughts so that he had expected a kind of immense ziggurat upside down in the earth. But no, it was what it had always been, a little over sixty feet in, diagonal, in diameter, circular, located in the middle of a small clearing. The entrance lay there open for them, as it had for so many others. No soldiers here, nothing more unusual than the thing itself. On the threshold, he told them what would happen next. There was in his voice only the shadow of, a, of only a shadow of the authority of a director of the Southern Reach, but within that shadow, a kind of resistance. Grace, you will stay here at the top, standing guard with the rifles. There are any number of dangers, and we do not want to be trapped down there. Ghostbird, you will come with me, and you will lead the way. I'll follow at a little distance behind you. Grace, if we are down there longer than three hours, the maximum time recorded by prior expeditions, you are released of any responsibility for us. Because if there were a world to return to, the person to survive should be someone with something to return to. They stared at him. They stared, and he thought they would object, would override him, and then he would be lost, would be left out here, at the top. But that moment never came, and an almost debilitating relief settled over him as Grace nodded and said to be careful, rattled off advice he barely heard. Ghostbird stood off to the side, a curious expression on her face. Down there, she would experience the ultimate doubling of experience with the biologist, and he couldn't protect her from that. "'Whatever you have in your head now, hold on to it,' Grace said, "'because there may be nothing left of it when you go down below.' What was coiled within his head, and how would it affect the outcome? Because his goal was not to reach the crawler, because he wondered what else might lie within the brightness that had come with him. They descended into the tower. Zero, zero, 0020 The Director Whitby's worthless report on the Blossom is on your desk by the time you go off to another pre-expedition interview of the biologist. The possible candidates for the 12th expedition whittled down to 10, and you and Grace, you and Lowry, pushing for your favorites, with members of the science department shadowboxing in the background as they whisper their own choices at you. Severance seems terminally uninterested in the question. It's not a good time to interview anyone, but you don't have a choice. The plant is blossoming is blossoming again in your mind as you conduct the interview in a cramped little office in the biologist's town, a place you've borrowed and can pretend is your own, with all of the appropriate psychological and psychiatric texts on the bookshelves. The diplomas and family pictures of the room's true occupant have been removed. In a concession to Lowry, for his studies, you've allowed his people to swap out chairs, light fixtures, and other elements of the room, as if in redecorating and, cha and changing the color scheme from placid blues and greens to red, orange, and gray, or silver, there's some answer to a larger question. Lowry claims his arrangements and recombinations can have a subliminal or, or instinctual effect on the candidates. To make them feel secure and at ease? You asked, a rare moment of poking the beast with a stick, but he ignored you, and in your head he was saying, to make them do what we want. There's the smell of water damage still, from a burst pipe in the basement. There's a water stain in the corner, hidden by a little table, as if you need to cover up some crime. The only giveaway that it's not your office, you're cramped, stuffed into your chair. The plant is blossoming in your mind, and each time it does, there's less time to work with, less you can do. Is the plant a challenge, or an invitation, or, an, or a worthless distraction? A message? And if so, what did it mean, assuming Whitby didn't imagine it? The light at the bottom of a topographical anomaly, from a door into Area X, on the tarot card used by the Seance and Science Brigade. 
the blossoming light of an MRI body scan, the one you endured last week. In the middle of all that blossoming in your brain, the kind of thing that would elicit a joke from Grace if only you could tell her, there, bestriding the world, the biologist, a talisman, arriving just as everything is closing in again and your time has become more limited. State your name for the record. I did that last time. Nevertheless, the biologist looks at you like you're an opponent, not the person who can send her where she so obviously wants to go. You note again not just the musculature of this woman, but the fact that she's willing to complicate even the simple business of stating her name. That she has a kind of self-possession that comes not just from knowing who she is, but from knowing that, if it comes down to it, she needs no one. Some professionals might diagnose that as a disorder, but in the biologist, it comes across as an absolute and unbending clarity. Tell me about your parents. What are your earliest memories? Did you have a happy childhood? All of the usual boring questions, and her terse answers boring too, in a way. But after that, the more interesting ones. Do you ever have violent thoughts or tendencies? you ask. What do you consider a violent act? she replies. An attempt to evade or genuine interest? You'd bet on the former. Harm towards other people or animals? Extreme property damage, like arson? The realtor at Star Lanes has dozens of stories about violence against houses, relates them all with an edge to her voice. The biologist would probably classify the realtor as an alien species. People are animals. Harm towards animals, then? Only toward human animals. She's trying to entangle you or provoke you, but the usual cross-referencing and analysis of intel turned up something interesting, something you can't confirm. While a grad student on the West Coast, she had worked as an intern at a forest ranger station in a, in a national park. Her two years there had roughly coincided with a series of what some might call tree-hugger terrorism. In the worst case, three men had been badly beaten by an assailant wearing a mask. The motive, according to the police, the victims had been tormenting an injured owl by poking at it with a stick and trying to light its wing on fire. No suspect had ever been identified. No arrest made. What would you do if your fellow expedition members exhibited violent tendencies? Whatever I had to. Would that include killing someone? If it came down to that, I would have to. Even if it was me? Especially if it was you, because these questions are so tedious. More tedious than your job working with plastics? That sobers her up. I don't plan on killing anyone. I've never killed anyone. I plan on taking samples. I plan on learning as much as I can and circumventing anyone who doesn't follow the mission parameters. That hard edge again, that sh the shoulder turned in toward you to block you out. If this were a boxing match, the shoulder would be followed by an uppercut or body shot. And what if you turn out to be the threat? The biologist laughs at that question, and gives you a stare so direct you have to look away. If I'm the threat, then I won't be able to stop myself, will I? If I'm the threat, then I guess Area X has won. What about your husband? What about my husband? He's dead. Do you hope to find out what happened to him in Area X? I hope to find Area X in Area X. I hope to be of use. Isn't that heartless? She leans forward, fixes you again with that gaze, and it's a struggle to maintain your composure. But that's okay. Antagonism is okay. In fact, anything helps you that in fact, anything helps you that helps her reject whatever traces of corruption you might have picked up, that might have adhered to you all unknowing. That might have adhered to you all unknowing. I think is how that's supposed to be emphasized. She says, It's a fallacy for you, a total stranger, to project onto me the motives and emotions you think are appropriate, to think you can get inside my head. You can't share with her that the other candidates have been easy to read. 
The surveyor will be the meat and potatoes backbone of the expedition, without a trace of passive aggressiveness. The anthropologist will provide empathy and nuance, although you're not sure whether her need to prove herself is a plus or a minus. She'll push herself further, harder because of that, but what will Area X think of that? The linguist talks too much, has too little introspection, but is a recruit from within the Southern Reach, and has demonstrated absolute loyalty on more than one occasion. Lowry's favorite, with all that entails. Before the interview, you met with Whitby, who had rallied for this discussion, in your office, amid the increasing clutter. It was the biologist you talked about the most, the importance of keeping her paranoid and isolated and antisocial, how there's a shift in the biochemistry of the brain, naturally arrived at, that might be what Lowry's secret experiments are trying to induce artificially. And since her husband has already gone to Area X, been read by it, this represents a unique, a unique opportunity, metrics-wise, because of that connection, because it's never happened before. That, in a sense, the biologist had forged a relationship with Area X before ever setting foot there. It might lead to what Whitby calls a terroir precognition, precognition, whatever that means. An expedition into Area X with the biologist would be different than with Whitby. You wouldn't lead, except in the way at a, except in the way at a, oh gosh, you wouldn't lead, except in the way at the store as a teenager you sometimes walked ahead of your dad so he wouldn't, so you wouldn't seem to be with him, but always with a look back at him to see where he was going. As the questioning continues, you're more and more certain of what you feel in your gut. You are reminded of Area X somehow. The biologist reminds you of being in Area X. The rest of the biologist's file is breathtaking in its focus, its narrowness, and yet fecund despite that. You're driving across the desert with her, in a tiny car, to check out the holes made by burrowing owls. You're lost on a plateau above an untouched coastline, stalked by a cougar, a place where the grass is the color of gold and reaches up to your knees, and the trees are blackened by fire, silver-gray with ash. You're hiking up a mountain in scrubland, up huge blocks of stone, every muscle in your legs protesting even as you're possessed by a wild giddiness that keeps you moving past exhaustion. You're back with her during her first year of college, when she made a rare confession to a roommate that she wanted isolation, and moved out the next day to her own apartment and, want and walked the five miles from campus home in utter silence, receiving the world through a hole in her shoe. You're certain you'll have to give something to Lowry to keep to give up something to Lowry to keep him away from the biologist, but whatever the price, you'll pay it. You des you decide as you order a whiskey for a change at the bar at Chippers. Order a whiskey for everyone at the bar for a change, all four of them. Because it's late, because it's a weekday, because Chippers is getting long in the tooth, and the clientele is getting older and older. Like you. The doctors told you cancer has blossomed in your ovaries, and it's going to spread to your liver before you can even blink, even get used to the idea. Another thing no one needs to know. And before we could even think of se about selling that house, the realtor is telling you, we had to pull ten layers of wallpaper off. All this woman had done for a decade was keep re-wallpapering her house. It was a hell of a lot of wallpaper, and garish, like she was putting up warning signals, wrapping her house from the inside out. I tell you, I've never seen that before. You nod, smiling with nothing to add, nothing to say, but happy to listen, terminally interested. It's plain old normal cancer, nothing like the accelerated all-out assault experienced by the last eleventh. It's just plain old life catching up with you, trying to kill you, and you can either take the aggressive chemo and leave the southern reach and die anyway, or you can hang on long enough to join the twelfth expedition, and, with the biologist by your side, go across the border one last time.
You've kept secrets before. What's one final one? Besides, other, more interesting secrets are opening up, because Grace has finally found something on Jackie Severance. There's, plen there's been plenty of dirt, including the scandal involving her son a blown assignment that resulted in a woman's death, but nothing until now that made any real difference. On a top-secret list, not of Jackie's open case files, but Jack's close, closed ones, which makes sense because Jack is a little easier. He's retired in his early 70s, and some of what he worked on exists only in paper form. Look at the fifth line item, Grace says, up on the rooftop after a quick sweep for bugs. You've never found any there, but it's worth being cautious. The line reads, Payment Request, SB, Project Serum Bliss. Is there more? It's not quite what you expected, but you think you know what it is. No, that's not the only one. There might be more, but the rest of the files from the period are missing. This page wasn't even supposed to be there. What do you think serum what do you think serum bliss means? Protocol back then would have meant it wasn't supposed to mean anything. Probably generated at random. It's flimsy, you say. That's not even S and S B. It's fucking rice paper, Grace says. It might mean nothing, but but if, somehow, the SNSB was on, was on Central's payroll, even just a little bit, a side project, and Jack ran the operation, and Jackie knew about it, and the SNSB had anything at all, anything at all to do with the creation of Area X, a lot of ifs, a lot of leaps, a lot more research on Grace's plate. Yet it's enough for you to begin to have an idea of why Lowry's new ally is Jackie Severance. And with that, we're going to call it a week. Hope people enjoyed. Nice to see some new faces this week. Thanks for tuning in. Um, to anybody not tuned in at this very moment, but are listening here, which, you know, you can do if you want. Um... <laughs> this is where the rambles start, um, which won't be long this week, I promise. Uh, I completely lost my train of thought. Oh, to anyone uh, not tuning in live, I do these live uh, every Friday, starting at about noon Eastern Standard Time on Free Read Fridays, where I read short stories and entire novels aloud. Such as Acceptance by Jeff Vandermeer, the third but apparently not yet final installment of the Area X slash Southern Reach trilogy. He's got a fourth book being put, being cooked, uh, cooked up at the moment. Um, don't know when that'll be out, um, but eventually. Same thing with the third uh, installment of the Blindopraxia books by Peter Watts. Those will get read aloud here on this channel, on this station. Uh, if you're tuning in via Twitch, I have all this stuff up on my YouTube, which should be in the stream description somewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, so one more installment. Next week should be the last one. Uh, Toby Frost says, many thanks for the stream. It's real. It's a real treat to have found your channel. Looking forward to digging through your playlists and tuning in in the future. Thank you, Toby Frost. I appreciate it. Um, I'm not going to bore people and uh, shill myself. Um, that may change uh, coming next year. I might put cobble together a Patreon, but I'm not going to... Very little about the format's going to change. I'm not going to take on sponsors because I can't monetize this at this point. Um, uh, and that I'm not sure I could, actually. I think that would be difficult. The legalities involved get sticky. Um, so it's, it's, it's fine the way things are. <laughs> I haven't been held to, held to account yet, so whatever. Um, I've also talked about expanding uh, the scope, uh, changing around my usual schedule, which is like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, where Mondays are Mecha Mondays and I do something giant robot related or Mecha adjacent Wednesdays. Our Warframe Wednesdays, where I do some Warframe for a couple hours. I'm thinking of nixing the Warframe Wednesdays, not because I dislike Warframe, but because nobody tunes into those, and 
less less even because of that, but because I want to expand my reading time, um, gives me an opportunity to do like uh, a dedicated bracket for like short stories or something that I can do or something. Anyway, that's that's my yammering done. Um, with that, I'm going to scoot. Um, I think at, uh, and next week will be the last installment, uh, provided no crises come up. Uh, so that will be the last installment of this. Uh, after that, the week following, where are we the week following? The week following is a blank week. I'll probably do some short stories then. Um, and then I am gone uh, for uh, the next week uh, due to something I had planned ahead for. Um, and I will be not there for the week of the 25th. Um, but I'll be back the, the next week. The uh, That'll be, what, September 1st? Yes, September 1st, if I'm reading my calendar correctly here. Um, and septem September 1st, we will start reading the final volume of the Rifters trilogy, uh, which is Behemoth, volume book two, volume or book two, uh, Seppuku. And uh, we'll, we'll get that done. So that'll be my two major trilogies back to back done. Yay! Okay, with that, I gotta run. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe, stay sane, be toasty, or cool, or damp, or dry, as per your personal preference or your geolocation allows, and be decent to each other. See you all later. Thanks again. Bye.